Why doesn't anything work anymore? The government, corporations, the schools, and even the church. Why aren't my prayers answered? Why is there so much violence? Is there anything I can do when I'm afraid and powerless? What is God doing anyway? Noted biblical scholar Walter Wink's 30 years of work and three books on what the Bible calls the principalities and the powers address these questions. And the most helpful and hopeful message is that the whole world was created good, including institutions and systems, and they belong to God, just like we do. They often lose their way, just like we do, but they can be transformed, just like we can, and we can help it happen. Now we're going to watch as Janet Wolf, gifted inner city pastor, and Jim Forbes, one of Newsweek's 10 best U.S. preachers, talk with Walter for our benefit about his work. Afterwards, we hope you'll continue the conversation. A lot of people are ready to give up on institutions, the biblical powers, and you may be among them. The government seems to be owned by big corporations and special interests. Companies appear to care more about profit than people. Schools aren't educating, and many people consider the church to be irrelevant. But what if all the well-intended institutions were in some way created by God and can be redeemed? What part would we play in their redemption? And in general, what difference would it make in your life if you understood the system to belong to God? People cannot live individualistically, as Americans are fond of thinking. They can only live in sociological units. They have to have families. They have to have something the equivalent of a, a nation or some kind of a larger encompassing body. There has to be an economy. There has to be some way of exchanging goods, whether it's by barter or by selling or what. Um, and so it is, we might say, the will of God that there be institutions, systems, and structures. Uh, Gerhard von Rad argues that the creation stories in Genesis are not, um, d don't end in Gen Genesis 3 with the uh, story of Adam and Eve, but the creation continues with the uh, creating of the table of the nations in Genesis 10. That is to say, people are not ready to get history moving until they've got their larger uh, uh, political uh, frameworks with, within which to live. But that doesn't mean that any God endorses any one particular system or, or, or a nation or, or economy. It simply means that these are necessary for human life and that they have God's blessing in that sense. Now, all of these institutions, though, are at the same time fallen. They're, at the very same moment that they're good, they're also fallen, which simply means, it doesn't mean they're totally evil. That's a misunderstanding. Uh, fallen just means they're no longer... Uh, in harmony with their divine purpose. They've, they've set their own self-interest higher than the, the interest of, of God and of the general good. Um, so that uh, every institution, no matter how much good it does in society, will at the same time be doing some kind of evil. They may be producing a very fine product but have terrible personnel policies or something of the sort. And at the same time, we want to affirm a third thing, which is that these powers can be redeemed. Now, these things have to all be held together simultaneously because if you just say the powers are good, then you seem to be baptizing every institution that comes along. Uh, the, uh, the, the rulers of South Africa during the reign of apartheid insisted that the Bible legitimated their rule. <laughs> Romans 13 says it's all right, uh, uh, that, there, uh, that it's necessary that there be powers and principalities that uh, and we must be submissive to them. But if you say that by itself, it becomes a form of oppression. So you have to simultaneously say they are fallen. The system of apartheid in South Africa was evil. And that it can also be redeemed, which the system of apartheid was, insofar it wasn't redeemed as such, but it was overthrown, and in its place a new government has come into being, which is um, really one of the most remarkable uh, events in the history of the of the world. So th this is the, um, the framework for our discussion uh, in this session. The powers are good, the powers are fallen, the powers can be redeemed. What does that mean in practical life? Hmm. I think the hard part has been for folks to see good in systems, um, especially those who have worked for transformation, 
who have worked for some kind of change, you see something that looks like apartheid, and you say, how can this possibly bring forth anything good? And the theology at its very core gave way to something new. I mean, there mean were the public, old the theology. old apartheid theology that says this is the rule and this is the good and this is the way God calls us to live, um, was exposed, unmasked for what it was, repented, went through very public pronouncements of falling away, folks who had said forever, this is God's will, standing up and saying, I no longer believe this is the will of God. And so as it began falling apart, people saw new possibilities for redemption of this thing, and in people where they thought there had been no possibility of conversion, it in fact was made public and visible. So that the most violent, or one of the most violent governments in the world, highest rate of incarceration, its very first act is the abolition of the death penalty. You know, as you speak of the South African triumph in terms of the liberation of that land, the idea that something could be both good and that it has fallen and that it is redeemed at the same time, mm -hmm. that becomes a healthy uh, conceptualization mm -hmm. because even in post-apartheid right. South Africa, we do not have a perfect society yet. I remember back in the 60s, in the late 60s and early 70s, everybody thought institutions were the cause of all the evil in the world, it seemed like, around universities especially. <laughs> so we had all these university shutdowns and so forth that were going to improve things, and in some cases they might have. But, um, but the assumption was that the institution as such was evil. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to get out of these institutions, so they went off and formed communes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which are super institutions because you've got to have meetings every night to decide who's going to clean up the kitchen. Right. Uh, so, so even when you, uh, when you go through the, all three of them, mm -hmm. even there you have to say they can only be redeemed within the framework or the reality of a, of a society which is also fallen. Mm -hmm. So the amount of redemption that's possible itself is limited by the fact that you're still existing in a fallen world economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, 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 you're existing in a situation in South Africa still where there's a tremendous disparity between rich and poor and so crime has just escalated to the point that people who weathered the apartheid and said I won't leave are now leaving simply because of the fear of, of everyday crime. So that uh, the, the miraculous transformation there is still made within the framework of a fallen reality mm -hmm. which is a good <laughs> reality ultimately because it's created by God. Mm -hmm. So these things kind of have to be kept together and circled back on each other so that we don't create uh, utopian illusions about how much improvement and transformation mm -hmm. it really is possible for us to bring about with this side of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. We can make some changes, but we can't bring in perfection. And we don't fall into the dualism which I think is prevalent right now in our world. People are dividing everything into good and bad. The rhetoric uh, in almost any political discussion, particularly in this country, is to label something. And as soon as it has been labeled not good in my eyes, it gets dismissed. It's not dealt with anymore. We just write it off. We push it over to the side. Um, so that people expect miracles from anything that gets labeled good and expect nothing from anything that gets labeled evil, which then doesn't allow us to engage in the reality of the powers that are coming into being. So if the civil rights movement didn't solve everything, then it's not okay, and we don't need to talk about it. It was or a waste celebrate. of time. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it hasn't solved everything. Clearly, there are still mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. Do you know, this could be helpful to us in our discussion these days about the role of government. All across the nation, people talk about, ah, too much government, too little. Then it occurs to me that maybe the ones who want to make government the solution to all our problems have the notion that government is good, the more the better. The others who want us to begin to cut back government because government is bad, their attitude is government is fallen. And maybe the truth is that government is a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. that some of the things they do reflect their fallenness all too well, and others could be a reflection of good, and that in order to talk about the appropriate role of government, we'd have to have some vision of what the government exists for. And it requires, I think, a specific responsibility for the church to mm -hmm. figure out what it is we're looking at, to remind folks, first of all, that the creation is good, 
Um, there's a lot of rhetoric in our world now that somehow some things are so evil there is no good in them. They can't be transformed. There is no hope for conversion. A lot of that goes on in the discussion around crime and punishment. We have some human beings that just need to be written off. They need to be locked up. They need to be executed. They need to be done away with. Traditionally, Christianity has really been uh, absorbed in the idea of personal salvation. And sometimes this is pictured as going to heaven when you die. You know, So you leave the earth behind altogether and go to heaven and everything will be perfect up there. But the Bible itself has a very strong um, emphasis on on the transformation of these principalities and powers. It's not willing to give up on them. There's this wonderful uh, scene in chapters 21 and 22 of the book of Revelation in which the, you know, the nations were all liquidated, it looked like, in chapters 19 and 20, and the vultures came and picked over their bodies. I mean, it's a very gory scene. And so you figure, well, the nations are finished. I mean, that's it. No more nations. And then suddenly in chapter 21, here come the nations marching into the holy city of Jerusalem that just come down from heaven, uh, from God to the earth. And, and these nations are bringing their glory, it says, into the heavenly city, the holy city, which I take to mean their, their contribution to, to, the, to world culture, you know, like Guatemalan clothing with all the brilliant colors and French cooking and <laughs> all the other contributions every co country has made. Uh, and then it says in chapter 22 uh, that the tree of life is there and the leaves of the tree were for the healing. That's mm -hmm. as far as the quote goes in Ezekiel. And John adds, of the nations. Mm -hmm. So the nations are going to be healed. Now, isn't that an amazing idea? That God's trying to also transform those institutions and st structures. It's like uh, the, the, uh, the, the, what Christ did to redeem the world was done not just for us, but also for the social systems and entities in which we work. A lot of people's depression has to do with their work and the meaninglessness or the harshness or the brutality of the work. And, and so you just can't make people redeemed without some context to put them in. And that context also has to be redeemed. So the, the, the church has this incredibly high calling. I mean, our task is to call all the principalities and powers, as Ephesians 3.10 puts it, uh, to make known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places the manifold wisdom of God. And that's a wonderful calling. I mean, we need to be saying to corporations like IBM and Gulf Plus Western and all the rest of them, you know, you're, you were bought with a price. Uh, you belong to God. You, you're not autonomous. You can't just do whatever you want to. You can't make profit the bottom line. You've got to take care of the general welfare. You belong to God. Mm, now, when's the church going to start talking like that to well, people who are in corporations? But I want to raise another question. See, we're always talking about what we need to say to the nations mm -hmm. and what we need to say to the corporations. The churches are yeah. powers, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> then I think we need to look at to what extent are churches sometimes good can churches be fallen all churches Always. are fallen <laughs> all churches are fallen um, some people are wondering can churches be redeemed mm -hmm. then and that so i think i think there's a tendency always for us to keep you know we're the good guys and we need to be patrolling mm -hmm. the other powers i think and, walter has a wonderful phrase in uh, unmasking the powers um, that we should be careful lest we become kept chaplains of the settled order Chaplains mm. of the settled order. Kept mm. chaplains of the settled order. I mean, we're paid mm. to actually mm. keep things mm. in place and to pronounce it the way it is is the way God wants it to be. We talk this mm. business about churches falling. I don't think it's easy for people who are parts of churches to see that. Uh, some help may be needed in this area. Uh, I want to mention several. When a church, because of the general milieu, will not receive women to be instruments of God's will and proclaimers of God's gospels or pastors to the people of, of God, that church has fallen for the general spirit in the age and is contrary to the vocation that I think God has called it. Or when a church has become con uh, content simply ministering to the needs of, of one racial group to the exclusion of others, mm -hmm. that, that church has fallen. There was a church mentioned in 
the, a Philadelphia paper not too, too long ago that said on the outside of the church, there was this sign that says, if you have HIV AIDS, you are not welcome to worship in this church. There is the exclusion of a whole group of people who are also children of God. Even if it calls itself a church, could it be that the angel from heaven would come and require their incorporation papers and say, with this attitude, you may no longer fly the banner of the kingdom of God. A couple of uh, places in the book of Revelation when it's talking about the angels of these churches, it says, unless you repent, I'm going to come and remo remove your lampstand from its place, which means close the church. So I, I think you're absolutely correct about that. And see, I have no trouble imagining that churches are fallen. For me, it's a hard p thing to remember that the church as an institution can be good. I mean, I think for most women who, who seek leadership in the church or seek ordination, the struggle is to believe that there's anything in the institution that can give life mm -hmm. because it is so powerful in its forms of death. The violence that I've experienced in my life is not from folks I don't know coming and bashing me. It is from inside the church. Um, where folks are so sure that they are writing, speak in the name of God, one of the and lash back out. One of the amazing things about the gospel story itself is that Judas is a part of it. Uh huh. You, uh, they could have left Judas out. You right. Know. They could have gotten the arrest handled any other way, or they could have just failed to say how the arrest was. Given. The fact that the church includes in its own story the fact that the betrayer mm -hmm. is the closest one to your own heart. You know the one who almost lies in your bosom. You know, the betrayer is your brother, your sister in mm -hmm. the church. The betrayer is the person who ought to be willing to die on your behalf. The betrayer is the person who holds the highest ideals that you can imagine mm -hmm. and is using them against you. you know? And I think for a lot of people, that, therefore, it's been hard to stay in the church. Many people have left the church because they're, they, in their imagination, there's no Judas. Mm -hmm. In their imagination, the church is supposed to be an ideal community. It's supposed to be a prototype of the kingdom of God. And then when they discover that not only is it not a prototype of the kingdom of God, but that Judas is there. But biblically, all the disciples are kind of a mess. I mean, they never do mm -hmm. get it right. They fall short over and over mm -hmm. again. And even the very first one on most of the list, Peter, um, is the one who denies and the one who takes all the way till Acts 10 to figure out that Gentiles are to be included in the early church. I guess mm -hmm. what that means is that in some sense, the, the God keeps on working with the redemption of these institutions as, uh, as, as a possibility. Otherwise, they, Jesus would have cast all the disciples out for their slowness to understand what was going on. And so I guess this this point I made earlier about God closing the churches down, I suspect that's the last thing you can get God to really do mm -hmm. because God is so eager to transform them mm -hmm. and to redeem them. And maybe the same is true that it's almost the last ditch effort for God to close down legitimate social structures if there's any slight hope Mm -hmm. that they might be redeemed so that they can serve the people rather than simply their own perceived survival uh, necessities or interests. I mean, I think that, that judgment is an important thing uh -huh. and that why should institutions be allowed to go on and on and on and destroy people? Mm -hmm. I guess there could have been a bloodbath in South Africa. And I'm trying to see God just straining it. No, I'm not giving up. But God, 80% of the people are, are subjugated and 20% of them are, are deriving all the benefit from that land. Don't you need, let an earthquake come. Uh, uh, but is it God that says, no, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, 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 I'm work I got this man Mandela in jail. I'm trying to do that. Just hang in with me. What I'm saying is, Walter, I used to be very clear about yes and no and good and bad. But the concept of the powers is forcing me to move into a more profound analysis of the mixtures of good and bad and, 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 and pushing me towards a higher level of tolerance. I think Martin Luther King was our best teacher on this 
theme. You know, he mm. he really basically worked from this framework. Um, he would not denounce American democracy as demonic. He called rather for the nation to reaffirm its own highest ideals. Uh, you know, and and he 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 didn't just try to redeem the black community, but he was also trying to redeem the white community from its sin mm -hmm. and call both of them together to this higher community, this, this beloved community which he identified with the kingdom of God. Um, so that uh, we, we have that, that tradition from him as a way of you know, holding these things together. Hmm. But you know, at the same time, it is a historical fact that the church in Laodicea, a hundred years after this letter was written, was out of existence. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist any longer. Mm -hmm. And there are situations where I don't think God destroyed that congregation. I think the congregation destroyed itself mm -hmm. in its own bickering and backbiting and, and, and wishy-washiness. Um, so, that, so that, yeah, there is, there is a final judgment sometimes mm -hmm. on institutions when they, as it were, self-destruct because the universe is so organized that you cannot long violate its harmony mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. breaking yourself on it. Mm -hmm. The churches we're giving up on are, in fact, churches in the inner city areas in the middle of places where kids and adults cry out for some word of witness, some kind of hope, some kind of healing. Folks are just hungry for a word, but we say, well, this church is gone, we have no need of it. And I guess I'm thinking about my own congregation on the edge of inner city, uh, existed since 1851 in its heyday, 1,600 folks, most moved out to the suburbs, so down to about a group of 30, had all but given up, didn't want anybody who was different, white and middle income. Everybody else was scary, didn't even know how to begin to carry on a conversation with other folks in the neighborhood, and yet believed that somehow, even though this was at the very end, I mean, how are you gonna keep the doors open, that God was still doing something, that possibilities for life still existed. Where we found life was not somehow figuring out a right answer, um, but praying to God in general, send new members and children. And I suspect now people would have been more specific because we got both, but the new members primarily came from folks on the streets, and folks struggling with uh, mental illness. And the children came from families who do not send adults with the children. We have a number of kids who come from a neighborhood where violence is just phenomenal. Most of our children have either been stabbed or shot or beaten or seen someone directly in their family, stabbed or shot or beaten. There are scars all over them. Um, in the midst of that atmosphere, more violent than any of us will probably ever live in, in that daily reality of violence, they have this thing called the church, which I tend to see as an institution and, and fallen, but they see as a source of life. One example would be Jeffrey and Portia are two of the little kids that come to the church. Jeffrey said that he went in to wake his sister up one morning, he said, come on, come on, it's time to go. She said, no, I'm not going. She pulled the covers over her head went back down under the covers and uh, Jeffrey pulled her again and says, time to go, time to go. No, I'm not going. She pulled her head back under the covers and then he went up and he said, I did just like this, church. He whispered the word church. She got up and she got dressed so fast that she beat him to the door to make it into the car in order to get to church on time. That notion of church being the place that gives you a whole new identity then spills over into their neighborhood so that when I dropped them off and there was um, a fight going on nearby. They're screaming at each other, I love you, I love you, see you later, tell God I love him too. I mean, this, this notion that at the same time the church has fallen, it's almost closed its door, it's given up, it doesn't want anybody different. It becomes the source of new life mm -hmm. for folks who are on the edge of life. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit hasn't quit working within those institutions. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they have a latent goodness. Mm -hmm. It's that there's an actual force working for transformation there. Mm -hmm. It needs a little help. It needs a little cooperation. But it, it's, the, uh, re, it's re, the recovery of the expectation of miracle, mm -hmm. which I think is at the center of the hope mm -hmm. in our day. Mm -hmm. that, that South Africa was a miracle. Mm -hmm. The fall of the Berlin Wall was a miracle. Mm -hmm fall of the dictatorship in the Philippines was a miracle. Now everything that's happened since then is not a miracle. Yeah. But, but 
there's only one game in town nowadays, it seems to me, and that's what the Holy Spirit is doing to transform these institutions 